All right, guys. Hey, this is Rick Bigger. We're going to talk about post-arrest care today. I built this flow chart to make things a little easier for you, kind of walk you through the uh, this acronym for post-arrest care, how we get there, and how everything kind of works. If you're talking about cardiac arrest and you look at the data where uh, we as paramedics in general can really improve is in our post-arrest care. Um, most systems, including ours at Owasso, are are pretty good at returning a pulse or getting ROSC. Um, the big improvement that we can make in care is what we do afterwards. And some of this is going to be a refresher for you guys. Some of this will be new uh, for everybody because this is based on the 2020 updo update for ACLS, which not everybody has had. We will be covering that soon. We're going to have PALS very soon and then ACLS. We can get caught up on some of the things that have changed. But let's talk about just, uh, just post-arrest today and go over that. And hopefully uh, you guys pick some stuff up from this. Uh, so we, uh, like I said, we got a flow chart here starting with ROSC. If you look in the box, it says detect with a sudden spike in CAPNO. So this is something that is not new for us. We've been doing, we've been using CAPNO and cardiac arrest for a long time, most of us for our entire career. But understanding how important it is, this is how we detect when ROSC happens. Typically, we're have somewhere, say 2025, as a level of CAPNO during an arrest, and then suddenly we have a jump where it's 35, 40, 50, 60, maybe even higher. Um, and what does that tell us? That tells us that we most likely have had ROSC and it's time to check a pulse and time to analyze that rhythm and see what's going on. Something has changed. Um, it's really the only thing with the exception of sodium bicarb that will cause a sudden uh, spike uh, in the cap note. And it's best practice for detecting ROSC is that sudden spike. So that's what we're looking for. We're doing CPR. We're, look, we're, uh, we're going through our ACLS care, we're watching the monitor, and we're watching that level of capnography to see for that sudden change. So we get that sudden spike, we check a pulse, we have it. What do we do now? The next steps are what are crucial to keep the patient, uh, keep that pulse for the patient and give them a chance to have a good outcome. A lot of us for a lot of years, it was just, okay, bam, we have a pulse, now it's time to move the person, give them the ambulance as fast as we can, get them to the hospital as fast as we can. So, what have we learned over what have what we've learned over the last 20 years is that simply just doesn't work. There we're too far away. You can't outrun this. We have to do a lot of things to keep that pulse and keep that patient alive until they get to the hospital to give them a good chance to live. If you look at the data, we lose most people again in transit to the hospital. And so that big improvement needs to come in our post-arrest care. So cool little acronym for it. We've all heard ABC. We've all heard that with assessments over and over again, and really post-arrest care is just a secondary assessment that's going to happen, and I'm going to uh, make some changes and treat some things that I find. The thing that we're going to add on that's new is the D and the E, so A, B, C, D, and E. You see in the flow chart it only says A, B, C, and then E. The 12 lead means D. Okay, I, put, I changed it and just put the 12 lead because that's the main thing that we're looking for in post-arrest. D actually stands for detect, detect or disability. Um, and you can use this uh, assessment for other things. It just fits with Ross very well, so I like to use it. So start at the top there with airway. The first thing we check is our airway. And now that we have a pulse, we need to re-verify our tube. We need to look at it, make sure the tube got secured, make sure it has a tamer on it, and make sure the patient's in a C-collar so that we don't lose that tube. Okay, When we're doing that and we secure with the tamer and make sure it's there, that's the time to recheck the depth of the tube. If you're not familiar with it, the easy calculation for what is generally the right depth is three times the size of the tube. So if you used a 7.0 tube, 21 at the somewhere from the teeth to the tamer, the lines on there are marked, 21 is about the right depth for most people. Okay, But we're not going to go just off of that calculation. That just gives us an idea um, if we're close. Now that things have calmed down, and we're not doing CPR and we can actually hear, this is the time to re-verify our tube. One with CAPNO, make sure that we still have CAPNO, and then now it's time to check breath sounds. If that tube was too deep and we were bagging the patient and it was working while we were doing ACLS care, um, it's not a huge concern that the patient's right main stemmed. What is a concern is if we leave it right main stem for a long period of time and we continue to breathe into just a lung, just one lung, especially with the BVM. We have risk of not uh, oxygenating, ventilating and oxygenating the pr patient properly that way. We also have a, a very good chance that we're going to cause 
uh, a pneumothorax and we're going to lose the lung. So this is the time to verify that that airway is good and it's actually secure before we move the patient. So we should make sure the tamer is good, make sure they're in a C collar, make sure we still have capnography, and then that's the time we check our breath sounds and make any adjustments that we need to the airway so that the airway is actually secure. Moving down our flow chart, next is our B, uh, our breathing. Okay, So breathing, what's breathing mean for us? Breathing in this case means ventilator. The patient needs to be placed on the ventilator. We should not be transporting the patient uh, from a WASO to a Tulsa with a BVM unless we're forced to by an equipment malfunction. We have the ventilators. They need to be used. They're much better than we are with the BVM. They deliver an exact amount of air that's measured by a machine, not us on adrenaline that's usually breathing too fast and uh, using too much of the tidal volume in the BVM. We know VBMs can be dangerous when they're used for a long time. They cause people to lose lungs. They cause people patients to be hyperventilated. Uh, we know it lowers their chance of survival the longer they're on the BVM. So we need to put them on the ventilator and we need to make sure we have the right settings. So moving down there, we have some settings per the new ACLS. It used to be that it was just kind of recommended and it was out there as a best practice. It's now, this is what it should be. Okay, they've changed it. They went away from, we should think about titrating O2s to so you should be titrating the O2 to maintain an SpO2 of 94 to 99. Um, kind of old way, uh, we would just throw them on 100% and we would leave them. It didn't matter what the SpO2 is as long as it was above 94. We didn't care that that patient's SpO2 was really high and that we were giving them way too high of a concentration of oxygen. We know now from studying it that we are giving patients too much oxygen and we're causing other problems. So how do we fix that? One, we titrate the O2 less. We also look at our respiration, our respiratory rate next there on the list. The respiratory rate should be 10. So our ventilator defaults to 12 breaths per minute. So that's something you're going to have to adjust. It's not the end of the world if it gets left on 12 but 10 is best practice. That's what ACLS wants. And they do not want the patients being hyperventilated. Last there is increased PEEP before FiO2. This is how we fix the problem with titrating. Our ventilator comes on and it defaults to five of PEEP. Physiological PEEP is three to five. Okay, so we need more than physiological PEEP if that patient isn't getting oxygenated right off the bat. So we put a pulse ox on them. After we've got the pulse back and we get a low pulse ox, most of us just reach over and we crank the FiO2 up to 100% and generally that fixes the problem. So the reason you're having to use so much oxygen is because you're not using the patient's entire lungs. So when they weren't breathing, their lungs collapsed and went flat. And then you showed up and put a BVM on them, you started breathing. And every time that you let off that BVM, their lungs went back to being flat. And it's you have to slowly get their lung back until it's full capacity. Kind of imagine a balloon that doesn't have any air in it. And, and it's also wet, so it's stuck together. We have to get it to blow up. If we blow into the balloon and then we let off, if we stop breathing into the balloon, it re-collapses down, and the air is not getting to all the alveoli to use them. So PEEP fixes that. PEEP helps reinflate their lungs, so we're using all those alveoli that we can to diffuse as much oxygen as we can, so we need a lower concentration. Uh, we don't breathe 100% O2. We bring 21% O2 naturally in the air. So that's the range we want to be in a perfect world. So if you're giving 100% FiO2, you should definitely be increasing the PEEP to move up. And if you have more questions about that in particular, check out the ventilator video for more in-depth explanation of PEEP and FiO2 and how to use that. Post resuscitation, moving down the flow chart is next to circulation. So A, B, C, uh, establish at least one large bore IV. So we have an IO already and a lot of people are just using the IO. And in the ambulance, they're not looking for an IV. They think they're done, and it's just not true. We need to be establishing at least one large bore IV, preferably two, and preferably both in the AC if possible. That's not always possible, but that is best practice, what we're looking for. The reason is because what we're going to need to do to keep the pulse. So if you watch my videos, I talk a lot about flow rates with IVs. Flow rates with an IO is basically the equivalent of a 22 gauge IV, which we all know doesn't move very much fluid. So when you're trying to get medications in quickly, you're trying to get fluids in quickly to keep the blood pressure up, the IO doesn't work that well. Most likely in this entire arrest that we just ran for 15 to 20 minutes before we got Ross back, our one bag, our 500 bag of fluid is now empty. So we've given 500 
a fluid, but it took 15 minutes to do it, or maybe 20, maybe more, to get that in. That's just not fast enough. We need to get more fluid than that. So we find hypotension in our patient, we need to treat it with fluids. We're gonna give one more 500 bag of fluids, and then we're gonna go to Levofed. So if you've already given 500, you only need to give one more bag, and we need to try to do that through an, through an IV, or push it through the IO while we're establishing an IV, and then we'll use the IV for the Levofed. Levofed can be given through an IO. It, it just doesn't work that well. It is preferred to give through a large vor IV in the AC, so that's what we're looking for, and that's why we need to get that IV. I'm moving down. A, B, C, D is next. The D, like I said, is the 12 lead. So the reason that we we mainly are looking to detect the 12 lead is because in, the patient's in cardiac arrest. There's a very high likelihood that they're in cardiac arrest because they had a cardiac event and we need to find it. In particular, we need to find if they're having a STEMI. If this patient had a STEMI and that's why they're in cardiac arrest, we've got them back down, we've got a pulse, but we won't keep it for long if we don't fix the STEMI. There's nothing we can do. The actual problem is the STEMI, so they need to get to the cath lab. We need to be able to find that. We don't want them to find that in the hospital when we get there, and then they have a 30-minute gap before they can get to the cath lab. So we need to try to take it in the take a 12 lead in the ambulance to detect a STEMI. And if we find it, make sure we call the hospital and let them know we have a post-cardiac arrest and we need and they're having a STEMI. So we're going to need to transmit that STEMI, that EKG to the hospital so they can get the cath lab ready. Um, if you want your patient to survive and they're having a STEMI, we have to be able to find these in the field. Last is exposed, the E, the bottom on the, flow, on the flow chart, expose the patient. This is something we forget about often, but we need to expose the patient and we need to prepare them for the move. By the move, I mean when they get transferred from, from our cot to the hospital. So A, B, C, D, and D really should happen before we ever even leave the scene. We should be able to verify all that stuff and get all that stuff started very quickly. Uh, right before the patient leaves. Once the patient leaves the scene, I'm just really monitoring the A, B, C, D, and E. Last is expose the patient and prepare for the move. We have to be efficient when we're, when we're moving the patient from our bed to the hospital bed. We, In order to do that, we need to expose the patient, we need to get their clothes off, and we need to uh, organize all the stuff that we put on the patient and and be ready for them to be transferred. So we can't have, if the patient's on a backboard, you have the backboard straps that are intertangled to the, all the different leads and the blood pressure is hung up in the SpO2. We need to fix this stuff so that when we get to the hospital, it's a smooth transition for our cot to the hospital's cot and we don't uh, lose an IV or try to pull the patient off multiple times and continue to find more and more straps that have been put on in random orders. Uh, on the way to the hospital, before we get there, we need to make sure the patient's exposed they're ready for care to continue at the hospital, and they're ready to be moved. Another thing with that is um, fluids and medication that you're giving. Okay, Once you get to the door of the hospital, you're moving the patient 20 to maybe 50 feet inside the hospital. The bag of normal saline that's hanging might move two to five liters of fluid in that amount of time. That is not going to change anything in any way. So discontinue your fluids at the door. Get rid of those so that you don't rip IVs out by bags of fluid falling on the ground or getting pulled. We don't want to lose an IV. It may be the only one that we can find. Sometimes IVs are very hard to get during cardiac arrest. We don't want to lose that IV over a bag of saline that's laying on the patient's lap. Okay? It's not If it's not doing anything, it's not being given, discontinue it, throw it in the trash and get rid of it. Let's not risk losing an IV um, because we leave that connected. Hopefully, guys, this right here, this is post arrest care, top to bottom. We find ROS, we use CAPNO, we run down our ABCDE algorithm. It's a good way to remember it. Hopefully, this helped you out and explained some things for you if you're having problems with this. If there's anything that you don't understand from this video, let me know. As I said, we're going to do PALS and ACLS very soon this year. Uh, we have PALS coming up within a month, so hopefully, you'll get any of your questions answered then. But if you have some you need in particular on post arrest care, Give me a call as always, shoot me a text, and I'll be more than happy to walk you through this so you can figure it out. I appreciate your time and listening to this. Thank you. Make sure that you fill out a 1085 so that you get credit for it. Just label it, post a rest care review, and label me as the instructor and get it turned in so you get your credit. Once again, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you guys soon. See you.